Hey, last time we started building all those cabinets around the refrigerator and a bunch of other stuff and we didn't quite finish. So in this video, I'm gonna finish all that. And I'm also gonna do a whole bunch of other stuff. So pay attention, cause a lot's gonna happen in this video. And if you blink, well, you're not gonna miss it cause I usually talk kind of slow, but you'll miss a little bit, so don't blink. And uh, check the links down below for uh, stuff we used in the video and Patreon and our website where you can get sweet merch and all that but bottom line we make some serious progress on the airstream in this video so make sure you watch the whole thing actually i'm not going to open that up because you'll see what we did you gotta wait for the video silly So because we ended the last video showing us very carefully putting the refrigerator inside the cabinet box, well, I thought a good way to start this video would be showing us very carefully removing the refrigerator from the cabinet box. Because although we did need to stick it in there to make sure that it fit, we don't want it in there yet. We still gotta paint the cabinets and make the doors and do all that jazz. So in it went and out it goes. So with our cabinet boxes all built, it's time to take measurements and make some cabinet doors. If I can figure out how to make the tape measure work. So I held our tape measure up to the cabinets and whatever the number was, well, that's how I knew what size to make my cabinet doors. Tricky, I know. I'll be making my cabinet doors out of poplar. You might be asking, why poplar? It's not very hard. This is a kitchen. Why not use something like, I don't know, hard maple? Well, I thought about that, but I used poplar for the face frame, and I did that because it's a lot lighter. And I'm trying to watch my weight. I mean, not my weight personally, although I could use to lose a few pounds, but I'm trying to watch how much weight I put into the Airstream. So I milled down a bunch of poplar, and then I cut it into strips that are two and a quarter inches wide because that is how wide I'm gonna make the frame for my shaker style cabinet doors. Once I had a bunch of strips cut down, I did all the math to figure out how long my rails and styles needed to be, and I drew it out on this little scrap piece of poplar. Then I set up my custom Bourbon Moth stop block, available on my website, link in the video description, and I cut all my parts and pieces that I needed to make the frames for my doors. I love the stop block because it makes repeatable cuts super simple. Once all my pieces were cut to the right size, I lowered my blade to one inch. I like cutting my mortises on my shaker style doors one inch because the math is super simple. And I like simple. Next, I found dead center of my stock pieces. Now they're three quarters of an inch wide, so I took a 3 8 inch setup block and I held it on both sides and drew a line. That gave me dead center. Now I'm gonna set the blade just to the left or right of that line. It doesn't matter which one. And what we're gonna do next is we're gonna run each piece through the table saw with the blade at one inch high. And once we run it through on one side, zip zap zoop, we're gonna flip it around and we're gonna run it through on the other side. This is gonna make sure that that mortise is dead center in the middle of the board and we don't have to, you know, worry about doing the math or figuring it out another way. So with my blade set up, I just ran each piece through, one side, flip it around, did the other side until I had a nice one inch deep groove right down the middle of all my pieces. Next, I went over to the dado saw and using a crosscut sled, I cut a tenon that was exactly one inch long. Now I determined this length by resting it against my fence on the first pass. I know that's exactly one inch. I test it with a setup block, it is. And then I can just pull the piece back and remove all of the excess. And I know that I have exactly one inch long tenons that should fit perfectly into my groove. Now, to be honest, I do leave them just a hair short. You can see above the tenon there so that there's a little bit of room for glue squeeze out to fill that void. But they fit pretty nice. So I take the time to cut all of my tenons on my rail pieces and I hook them together with my styles and boom, I have a nice shaker style frame just like this. With all my frames cut and assembled, next I need to cut my panels for the inside. So I take my internal measurements of that, you know, square void in the middle, and then I add two inches on the width and the length because my tenons are an inch long, so I have to account for that on either side. 
Now I'm gonna use half inch MDF for my panels. And yes, I forgot to turn my dust collector on there and it was dusty and messy and I probably should have been wearing a mask, but I didn't, sue me. Pretty soon I had all three of my panels cut. Remember, they're an inch longer on length and width, but there's one problem. A half inch isn't gonna fit into that quarter inch slot. So we're gonna have to add a rabbit to all four sides. So I take all the panels over to the dado saw. I run them tight against the fence. That sets my distance, giving me a one inch lip. And then I pull it back to remove all the excess. As you can see here, now I got a quarter inch lip that'll fit in my quarter inch groove. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna make the panel flat on the back or the inside of the cabinet. And it'll look like a normal recessed shaker style door on the front. Now you might be asking why? Why do this? Why not just use quarter inch MDF as your floating panel? Well, I didn't have any in my shop and I didn't want to go buy some more. Also, this door here is crazy big and I was worried that quarter inch MDF wouldn't give it enough rigidity and it might warp over time. So I opted for the thicker, yes, heavier half inch because I think it'll wear better. Do I see the irony in the fact that all the weight I saved by using poplar instead of maple, I now wasted by using half inch MDF instead of quarter inch? Yeah, I, I see that now. And you have a point, but let's move on, shall we? With all my parts and pieces cut, all I needed to do now was glue them together. So I went over to my work table and very carefully, I smeared glue on all the appropriate parts and pieces and I stuck them in clamps. And if you're wondering how I smeared that glue, well, I used my patented glue spreader, like always. Plus, you can lick your fingers when you're done. Kind of like when your mom gives you the batter after she makes cookies and you get to lick it off. It's always a nice treat after a hard day's work. While I waited for those cabinet doors to dry, I had a little time on my hand. So I decided I might as well start working on the table that's going to go in between the dinette bench that I built a few videos back. So I took measurements. The table has to sit down on this lip because when it's not a table, it's gonna be pushed down to become a bed. I built the entire wraparound bench from white oak plywood and I trimmed it out in white oak. So I figured, well, I might as well make the table out of white oak to match. Now, not only does this table need to be the right size to fit inside that lip in between the dinette and become a bed, it also has to be the right thickness so that when you put the mattress on the table, well, it's the same height as the bench seat so that you're not sleeping on an uneven surface. And that thickness of the table needs to be an inch and a half. So I'm gonna build the entire table out of three quarter inch oak. If you're like, wait, that math doesn't add up. You just said inch and a half, but you're building it out of three quarter inch oak. I don't understand. Well, don't worry, you will. I have a plan, trust me. Now I took all my pieces, I milled them up, I stuck them in clamps and I glued them together into one solid oversized panel. That's important. And then I set that aside. Remember how I said we we're gonna be doing a lot in this video? Well, while we wait for the cabinet door glue to dry and we wait for the tabletop glue to dry, I thought I might as well start working on this little side table. So I'm gonna build this side table right in between the fridge cabinet and the bench cabinet. And I'm just gonna kinda of make it part of each of those things. Meaning I'm not gonna build a separate cabinet box for the nightstand. I'm just gonna kinda of build off of what's already there but it's a little taller than the bench seat, so I do have to create a panel that perfectly fits against the wall on that right side. So I scribed a piece of scrap quarter inch ply until I got the right shape. Now I wanna make this out of oak plywood as well, just like I did the bench seat. The only problem is I don't have any more oak plywood that's thick enough, but I did have some quarter inch oak plywood. So I'm just gonna take that quarter inch oak plywood and glue it to a piece of half inch plywood and then boom, I'm gonna have a three quarter inch thick piece of white oak veneered plywood. Almost like I bought it at the store, but I didn't. I made it myself. Now, if at this point you're lost and very confused because there's a lot going on, I don't blame you. Just stick with me. It's all gonna come together in the end. With my piece of white oak veneered plywood all dry, I took the template that I made out of quarter inch plywood. I added some double stick tape to the back of it, and then I stuck it on the bottom side of my freshly minted white oak plywood. Basically, I'm using this as a router template. 
Next, I went over to the bandsaw and I trimmed off all the excess plywood that I could, just leaving a little bit of an overhang because I don't wanna to have to work too hard with the router bit. Once I had all the excess trimmed off, I used a flush trim router bit from Bits and Bits to follow along that quarter inch plywood template stuck to the bottom and create a perfect duplicate out of my freshly made white oak ply. Now, this piece is three quarter inch and my template was quarter inch, so I'm a little worried that it's not gonna fit as tight against the wall as my template. So on the inside, I used a chamfer bit and I added a back bevel along the edge that's gonna come in contact with the airstream, which slimmed down that point of contact to a quarter of an inch, so I know it's gonna fit exactly the same as my template did. Did any of that make any sense? Anyways, and then I set that piece aside because we're just moving forward here. Next, I needed to create a face frame to span the gap along the front. So it was back into the shop. I milled down a bunch of pieces of white oak and boom, I had a face frame that if my measurements are correct, should perfectly fit between the bench and the fridge cabinet. Because it's a face frame, I hooked it together the same way I hooked together all my face frames with a little glue and a little pocket screw. It's actually pocket screws, but screws doesn't rhyme with glue. Once I had the face frame all glued and screwed together, there was just one thing left to do. My favorite activity of all time, sanding. Craig was somewhere and I didn't wanna wait around until he got back so he could sand this for me. So yes, I did it myself. Then I carried my face frame into the Airstream to just double check and make sure that it fit the way I wanted it to. As you can see, it's a nice tight friction fit in between that bench and the fridge cabinet, just the way I planned it. Now back to that piece of white oak veneered plywood I made. Now I left it long because I didn't know how far out it needed to come. So I took the measurements off the wall to the edge of that face frame and then I cut it down to size and it just gets wedged in there between the face frame and that back wall. Again, a nice tight friction fit so Everything's, you know, tight and friction fit. Then all I had to do was cut it to the right height, which was easy enough to mark off of my face frame, which was already the right height. Then before I installed it, I wanted to add some pocket holes on the back of this, so I had an easy way to attach it to the face frame and that back wall. Then while I was at it, I figured I might as well go ahead and make the drawer faces because I got the face frame sitting right here and it'd be a lot easier to take measurements on top of my workbench than when it's already installed in the Airstream. Now I was digging through my scrap wood pile and I found this random glued together piece of white oak. So I just decided to cut it down and make my drawer faces out of that. I mean, why go through the effort of gluing up a whole nother panel when this one's just given to me from the wood gods? in my scrap pile. Pretty soon I had my drawer faces cut to the right length and width with a nice little 3 30 seconds reveal around each side. And then I figured since I have all these parts in here on my workbench, I might as well just go ahead and finish them now so that I don't have to do it in the Airstream and risk drip and finish all over the place. So I grabbed a can of Rubio Monocoat Cotton White because that's what I used to finish the bench seat and I smeared it all over the side panel, the face frame, and the drawer faces. While I was busy doing that, Craig was nice enough to take my tabletop out of clamps and start sanding it down, which he did a fine job of. Where the heck were you earlier? Anyways, after he had the entire panel sanded down, I went over to my table saw. Now you'll notice that my outer two boards on either side of this glue up are a little wider than all of my internal boards, and I did that on purpose. It's so that I could trim an inch and a half slice off of each side, and then they would match all those internal boards. Now you might be saying, well, why didn't you just make it the right size to begin with? Well, next I took that inch and a half slice and I marked it along the edge so I could remember exactly how it needed to go back, you know, into its original position. And then I flipped around the whole panel and I trimmed another inch and a half slice off the other side and I marked this one as well so that I could get that one back into its original position. If you're confused, don't worry. Basically, you gotta know I got this piece on that side that I trimmed off and this piece on that side that I trimmed off. This will all be important here in just a second. 
Then I took the entire panel over to my workbench and I got a nice square edge on both sides. A little zip on that side, a little zoop on that side, and boom, nice square flat edges. Once I had those cut, I measured in, well, it was just an arbitrary distance. But basically, I took the length that my panel was too long, and I divided it by two, and I cut that much off of each side, which gave me the right length for my panel. And I had these two spare pieces. Now remember when I said I needed this three quarter inch tabletop to really be an inch and a half? Well, here's where that starts to make sense because I'm gonna take these little strips that I cut off the end, like this, a zip zap zoop, and then I'm gonna fold them up underneath and glue them in place. That's gonna bring the thickness of my table up to an inch and a half thick, which is what I need it to be resting on top of that lip in between the bench seat to be at the right height for my bed, if that makes sense. And because I'm folding this over, I get a nice book matched look on all that end grain and it'll look pretty darn seamless when I'm done. So after smearing a bunch of glue on one end and then doing the same thing to the other end, I now have an inch and a half thick table visible on both sides. But what about those edges? Those are still three quarters of an inch. Yeah, but remember those other strips that I cut off over on the table saw to begin with? Well, I cut those down to the right length so they would perfectly fit in between on the bottom. And now I have a nice border around the entire table that looks as if it's part of the table because it's all book matched and grain matched. And I just glue it together and boom, an inch and a half thick table. I don't know if you could tell, but I was really, really trying to build the excitement with the way that I, I talked about that, and I don't feel like it really came across as that exciting. Bourbon Moth, this is Jason. Yeah. Okay. Hat. Uh-huh. T-shirt. Yep. Beanie. Sweatshirt. Another T-shirt. All right. I'll be right there. Dude, what are you doing? Oh, what's up, man? I'm delivering orders. Why don't you just sell stuff through your website? Website? I don't know nothing about no website. What do you mean you don't have a website? Why don't you get on Squarespace? Anybody can create a website. It's super easy. And they have a ton of different templates to choose from, so you can customize it any way you want. Yeah, but believe it or not, I actually like doing this, so what if I still want to meet people in person and make sales that way? No, I, I get that you like doing this, but if you still want to do this, that's fine. You can just take the orders through your website, and then they have point of sale set up. So you can sell stuff directly to people in person with a credit card, and then it's linked up with your website, so it keeps track of all your inventory and everything like that. Would there be anything on there that would help me come up with new ideas? Because it's hard for me to draw out all these images and print everything and sell it. You can also create custom merch right there on the website. Yeah, Squarespace has a whole platform where you can create custom merch, you can generate passive income all directly through your Squarespace site. Right now is the best time to sign up too because if you go to squarespace.com slash bourbonmoth woodworking, you get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. All you gotta do is use coupon code bourbonmoth woodworking at checkout. 10% off, no questions asked, man. 10% off? The next morning I came out and I sanded all my inch and a half thick edges. And then I wanted to round over the corners, but I didn't have a router bit chalked up in my router that was long enough to match that template. So I just used the template to trace out the curve that I wanted. And then I just sanded it down with the Rotex. And honestly, it looked pretty darn good. So sometimes being lazy is okay. Then I used a quarter inch round over bit to add a nice soft edge to all the, well, the edges, obviously. And then I flipped over the entire table and I did the same thing on the bottom. And here's where you can see how it's not really an inch and a half thick. It just kind of looks like that. And then of course I gave everything a nice final sanding because I'm a woodworker, blah, 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 blah. 
Now I have this special base that I got for the Airstream that allows the table to go from a bed to a table with just the flick of a switch or this release tightener thing on the bottom. You do one, raise it up a little bit. You do the other, raise it up a little bit more. Ooh, ah. Now I'm not gonna actually install this table yet because I haven't laid the floor in the Airstream and I've gotta lay the floor before I actually install the table. But this will give you an idea how it's gonna look. It can go from table and then be lowered down to a bed and there'll be cushions that'll sit on top of the seats and on top of the table that will create the bed. Anyways, with the table done, the cabinets were finely dry. So I went back into the shop and I took those out of clamps. Then I ran all the cabinet doors through my drum sander on both sides to get them nice and smooth. I took them over to my drill press, I drilled out for my Euro style hinges, and then I installed those concealed European style hinges. Why do they call them European style hinges? What's an American style hinge? That's what I want to know. Anyways, then back into the Airstream, I installed the corresponding parts for those hinges inside the cabinet, and then I clipped my doors in place, and ooh, they fold down quite nicely. Now, they needed a stop, so I added these little magnetic latches that would stop them from going inside the cabinet box, and then I needed something that would keep the cabinet doors open because these are mounted in a horizontal position. So I got these little cabinet stay locking mechanism thingy-mawatsits. I don't know what they're called or even who makes them. I found them on Amazon and I'll include a link in the video description in case you ever need something like this for your projects. But basically they're super easy to install. You can adjust the tension on them depending on how light or heavy your door is, as you can see me doing right here with an Allen wrench. And then when you open the door, well, it stays. See? What? Stays. Now one of my least favorite things about cabinet making is as soon as you get the entire cabinet put together with all the drawers and door faces and hardware and everything and it looks all nice and cool, well the very next step is you gotta come in and take it all apart because now it's time to paint. One step forward, one step backwards. Because I don't want to tape off and tent off everything and try and spray these things inside the Airstream, I'm going to paint them the same way I painted the other kitchen cabinets, which is just using a brush and roller to paint the actual boxes and face frame, and then I'll spray all the cabinet doors. So I used a tinted primer and primed everything with two coats first, then I sanded it down, and then I started laying down my color. In the shop, I was busy well, pretending that there was a nuclear holocaust, apparently. Or, really, I just didn't want to get paint all over my shoes and pants, like I normally do when I spray. Luckily, Craig bought me this nice Tyvek suit that keeps me all tidy and clean. Now, I know a lot of you are going to ask about my painting setup, so here it is. It's simple, and let me just preface this by saying I'm not a great painter, but... The system seems to work really good for me. I use a Fuji HVLP Q5, and I use one of their T75 guns, I think is what it's called, with a 1.8 millimeter needle in there for spraying latex. I thin down the paint a little bit with water straight out of the tap because distilled water is for wusses. And then I just go and spray everything, and it usually turns out pretty good. By the time I finished spraying all my cabinet doors, I had the boxes and the Airstream all done, and I was ready to finally put my cabinet doors back where they originally were. So I reinstalled all of my hinges. Yes, I marked these before I took them off the first time, so I knew they would go back exactly how I left them, and I didn't even take the clip parts off of the face frames when I painted because I didn't want to mess with them. All my reveals were set and nice, and I didn't want to have to do that again. I reinstalled my magnetic latches and I clipped everything back in place, including my little door stay things so that they would stay. And finally, I clipped on my big cabinet door and things were looking pretty nice and clean. Ooh, ah. Now, because this is an RV and it's going to be bouncing down the road and 
there might be a circumstance where a cabinet door flies open and food comes flying out and hits you in the head. I picked out all this locking hardware from rejuvenation.com. It's nice because it locks the cabinet doors when they're shut, so, well, that simply can't happen. With my cabinet doors installed and my hardware on, it was time to get back to this other project. I know, we've got like five projects going on at once, but don't worry, it'll all come together in the end. With our face frame finished and our side panel finished, I very carefully wedged everything back in place between the bench seat and the fridge cabinet, using a square to make sure, well, that it was square, because what else would I do with a square? Then, because I pre-drilled for pocket screws, I used those pocket screws and I attached my side panel to the face frame and I attached my side panel to the back wall and I even sent a few screws right through the side panel into the side of my bench. And if that wasn't strong enough, I climbed inside the fridge cabinet. I just didn't turn the camera so you could actually see me do this. And I sent some screws through the inside of the fridge cabinet into the side of that face frame. So this thing was pretty flippin' sturdy. Now the one problem is I needed a place to rest my drawer slides. So I cut a bunch of scrap pieces of plywood, I added some more pocket holes, and I created these little shelves that were at the right height to match my face frame. I used a level to make sure that was the case, and these would be the perfect spot that I could set all of my drawer slides. So I added two on the bottom, one in the front and one in the back, and I added two on the top, one in the front and one in the back. I mean, you could probably guess that's what I was gonna say. And then I installed my drawer slides. This is very easy because I just set them in place and then added a couple screws right through the bottom into that plywood. I'm using Rockler's new undermount drawer slides for this one because, well, they sent them to me and I've used them before and I was actually really impressed with how well they worked. After my drawer slides were installed, it was back into the shop to make my drawer boxes. I'm making these the same way that I've made them a hundred times before in other videos. Just some Baltic birch. I cut a nice groove on the bottom to hold my panel. And then I sand all my pieces. And, um, well, then I hook them together. I was trying to find more steps in there to tell you, but that's pretty much it. And if you want more detail on how I hook these drawer boxes together, well, you can click that little link in the upper right-hand corner. And you can watch a how-to video that I made last year. With my drawer boxes all put together and the little rockler provided clips on the bottom, I slid them in their appropriate places on my little nightstand and I heard that satisfying click as they locked into those drawer slides and seemed to work perfectly. Next, I needed to create a lip on the other two sides that I could rest the top for my cabinet upon. So I just cut some more scrap pieces of Baltic birch plywood and using a level to make sure that everything was level, I screwed those scrap pieces to the back wall and to the side of the cabinet, making a nice little lip around the perimeter, you know, that I can set the top on. That's all I have to say about that. Now before I actually installed the top, I decided it was probably a good idea to install my drawer faces first. Because without any top on there, it's going to be pretty easy. I can just reach in and screw the drawer faces in. If the top is already there, I'd have to use double-sided stick tape or some other crazy method. And why make it harder on myself? There's really no need. After I got the top drawer face installed, I did the exact same thing to the bottom one. And by that I mean... I installed that, and then I cut a piece of quarter inch ply to serve as my top. Isn't that pretty? I'm just kidding. That's just a template I made out of quarter inch. Remember this stuff? Dura resin? But you guys said it's not pronounced Dura resin. You said it's pronounced Dura resin, which is stupid, and I'm going to keep calling it Dura resin. Anyways, I decided that would make a nice top for the side table and complement the kitchen counters, you know using it in multiple places. So I used my template to trace out the rough shape and I cut it roughly to size using my track saw. Then I added some more double-sided tape on the bottom of the Dura resin 
and then I stuck on my quarter inch plywood template. Now last time I used my big boy router because I was afraid it wasn't going to cut through this stuff very easy. And this time I was too lazy to get out my big boy router because I already had this router sitting on my workbench so I just used it instead. And it went pretty slow. And as you can see it made a huge mess. But that's okay. I got it cut to the right size and shape in the end and all there was left to do was to remove my double sided tape and carry this piece into the airstream and plop it in place. Cause there's nothing I like more than a good plop in place. See? Watch. Ooh. That was a good plop in place. I like it. Then I, well, I drilled some holes in the front of each drawer so that I could install this hardware. This is the same hardware I used on the kitchen drawers, so that matches as well. Eventually, I'm going to have to come back and add some liquid nails to permanently install that top, but that's good enough for now. And then finally, since we began this video taking the fridge out of the Airstream so we could get everything done, it only made sense that we end the video bringing the fridge back in and once again very carefully sliding it in place even more careful this time because we don't want to scrape that fresh paint now a lot of you had concerns in the last video that I needed to secure the fridge to the cabinet somehow so it wouldn't fall out while we're driving down the road well duh I just didn't do that the first time because well I didn't want it permanently installed yet the fridge comes with these nice little tabs on the top and bottom so you can screw it directly to the face frame and then it won't fall out. With that, there was only one thing left to do. And that was try and catch this fly that's been in the Airstream for hours. Come on, Jason, get it. You can do it. Go, go, almost. Oh. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Air attack. I bet everybody thought I was gonna forget to add the liquid nails and permanently affix this top. Well, guess what? I didn't. And I know last time a bunch of you were like, you should definitely not have used liquid nails. You should have just used silicone caulking because liquid nails is too strong and that top is gonna crack and you should never use liquid nails. And I read all your comments and I thought about it. And then you know what? I decided I just don't care. And I'm gonna use liquid nails anyways because I'm a rebel. That's right, living on the dangerous side. Ooh. But no, in all seriousness, I think that's everything I needed to accomplish for this video. I have a feeling this is gonna be a lot more comfortable when there's cushions on it, because right now it kind of hurts my bum. And it is getting extremely difficult to film in here, because, well, it's getting pretty filled up. So hopefully you could, you know, get kind of a view of the whole thing. I can only put the camera in so many spots. But I hope you enjoyed that video. Check the links down below, down there, for uh, all the tools and supplies and hardware and all that stuff that we used. There's also a link to our Patreon page. We just picked our next winner for our Patreon contest. So we're going to go out to some lucky person's house here in a month or so and do another build. And if you want a chance to win that for yourself, well... Go check the link in the video description because we're going to do another contest very soon. What else? Uh, I think that's it for now. We're getting close. Ta-ta. See you later. Bye. Are you still there? This is awkward. I don't know how to end these things. Oh, my cell phone's ringing. Gotta go get that. See ya.